Kosraji, over to you. Thank you. Um, good evening, audience, and good evening, our distinguished panelists today. Um, so today, as a part of this ongoing uh, session, understanding Nepal's foreign policy, so we'll be holding discussion on new book written by former Indian ambassador to Nepal, Ranjit Rai, uh, that is resetting Kathmandu dilemma, resetting Nepal-India ties. So dear audience, we have Ambassador Rai as a panelist, and also we have Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, he's a research director at NICE, and also Atul Kumar Thakur, policy analyst um, and you know, columnist. He keeps writing on different Nepali newspaper as well as in the newspapers. So um, I just want to talk briefly about, just to give you a few words about uh, Ambassador Rai. He is diplomat torn writer. He has become a celebrated writer in Nepal already. Um, so Ambassador Rai previously served as the ambassador of India in Nepal. He's an Indian diplomat with over 30 years of experience in the Indian Foreign Service, which includes participation in complex negotiation, both at bilateral and multilateral level, and extensive work in conflict and crisis situation. So as a senior policy advisor to the United Nations mission in Kosovo, Ambassador Rai worked in close collaboration with the UN Assistant Secretary General within the Department of Peacekeeping Operation on issues related to field operation. So in his past role as Joint Secretary North, at the Indian Ministry of External Affairs. Mr. Rai also served as Ambassador of India to Hungary with concurrent accreditation um, to Slovenia, Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina, and then Ambassador of India to Vietnam back in 2010 to 13, where he reinvigorated bilateral defense and trade cooperation. So he was also a member of Commonwealth high level groups and governance established by Commonwealth head of government at their summit in Malta back in 2015. So Ambassador Rai has come up with a very interesting book titled Kathmandu Dilemma, Resetting Nepal-India Ties. So this book has steered a lot of debates, discussion, and of course, some controversy here in Kathmandu. So we'll be focusing on this particular book highlighting various dynamics of Nepal-India relation and also discuss the ways forward to restore, reset Nepal-India ties. So we'll be first, you know, asking Ambassador Rai to highlight about his book, tell us something about uh, his book, his experience. And then we have two other panelists. The other panelists also will be sharing their observation about the book. And then we'll have a few question and answer session. And also, uh, we'll also hope to receive questions from our audience. Uh, and we'll also be taking those questions. So without further delay, I want to start from Ambassador Rai, the author of the book. So Ambassador Rai, can you please share uh, with us what prompted you to write this book shortly after you uh, wrapped up your tenure in Kathmandu? And can you also provide us a brief overview of the book, like what you have covered, what experience you have shared with the readers, uh, and what can readers expect from this book? Over to you, Ambassador Rai. Yeah, namaste, and thank you very much, uh, Koshrajji. It's really a pleasure. I want to also thank uh, NICE for inviting me to this very important conference on Nepal's uh, sovereign policy. Now, you know, I had a quite a long association with Nepal for over 20 years. And, you know, this is a country that I've worked with both at headquarters and later as ambassador. And it's a country that, with which India has very, very close, uh, even intimate relationships. And, you know, somehow I had the perception that there was a lot of misunderstandings, prejudices, a lot of historical baggage uh, in the relationship between the two sides. And in fact, there was also a lot of ignorance and lack of awareness. You know, in India, I've met many people who travel all over the world and who haven't been to Nepal, which is just, uh, you know, from New Delhi, it's an hour and 15 minutes. 
So I felt that, you know, it's important uh, to bring the, the nature of this relationship, you know, the warmth and the friendship of the relationship and also the problems uh, and the issues that, you know, continue to create problems in the relationship before the ordinary public. So my target audience uh, in writing this book is not experts uh, uh, and academics so much. It's really the ordinary public. And as I say in the book, you know, this is not a scholarly work. This is really, you know, my perceptions, my assessment based uh, on my long experience of dealing with Nepal. And, you know, the book is divided broadly into two parts. Uh, so, you know, the first part deals with the political uh, relationship and especially with the major transformations that have taken place uh, in Nepal in the last two or three decades. And, you know, how India saw these transformations and, you know, what India's role in these processes were. Uh, and the second part of the book deals with, you know, the specific uh, sort of civilizational and economic underpinnings of the relationship, the role of other countries in Nepal. And, you know, I conclude uh, with, um, with an epilogue. Uh, you know, I wanted this book to be forward looking and not mired in the past. So I concluded with an epilogue in terms of what I think we should do uh, to reset the relationship and move it forward. And, you know, underlying the whole book is the first chapter, uh, which is really looking at uh, uh, each other's perception, you know, what India thinks about Nepal, what Nepal thinks about India, what is the nature of Nepali nationalism, why does India become, you know, an issue constantly in, uh, you know, the politics of Nepal. So I wanted, uh, you know, readers and especially uh, readers in India to understand uh, uh, you know, the nature of Nepali nationalism, which is based on its geographical location. It's based also on the cultural uh, connect with India. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, based on, uh, you know, the historical uh, feeling of Nepal, that it's a yam between uh, two, you know, hard rocks. Uh, so I wanted to explain this. And of course, the other aspect is that uh, you know, whether we like it or not, India has been uh, associated with, associated with, closely associated with the major political transformations uh, in Nepal, you know, from 1950 onwards. Uh, and, and, you know, that has had its own uh, repercussions uh, and consequences. Uh, so the first chapter is really like a Shapo chapter, which runs, I think, uh, through the whole book. And for anybody to understand uh, Nepal-India relationship, I think it's very important, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to understand uh, the elements of Nepali uh, nationalism. For the Nepali readers, I also wanted to bring in much more transparency into the relationship. Because of my association with Nepal, I know that there are a lot of perceptions, negative perceptions in Nepal, you know, that India was supporting the Maoists, uh, you know, India is anti-Nepal. Uh, during the Madhesi uh, agitation, India imposed a blockade. Uh, so there were a lot of these perceptions. And I wanted to explain to the Nepali public what was going on in, in India's mind when all this was happening. What was India's policy? Why did we approach the kind of policy uh, we had? For instance, during the Maoist insurgency, our policy evolved over a period of time from a period, you know, when we saw the Maoists as a major threat, not only to Nepal, but to India as well, and wanted them to be crushed militarily. Uh, we, our policy evolved uh, to support uh, political settlement uh, and uh, democratic mainstream of the Maoists. So I really wanted to give uh, an Indian perspective, uh, 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 you know, to some of uh, these developments. On the title of the book, many of my Nepali friends have said, why have you called it Kathmandu Dilemma? Why don't you call it Delhi Dilemma? So they have a point. Actually, it's Delhi's Kathmandu Dilemma. So what is this dilemma? And this dilemma is basically, you know, we have several objectives in Nepal. And what happens is you follow a certain policy approach, uh, you know, to achieve, say, objective A. Uh, and in the process, uh, you tend to end up complicating the uh, achievement of objective B. And so then there is a cost correction in policy. And this is the constant dilemma that I think policymakers in India uh, are grappling with. 
uh, and and so I wanted to you know say uh, you know call this book Kathmandu uh, Dilemma. I want to just conclude by saying you know I it's an honest book uh, and I've written quite frankly. And the reason I've done that is because I think people must know the nature of the relationship and we cannot brush issues under the carpet anymore. You know, I think we have to tackle issues as they arise, whether it is the 1950 treaty, I have a very detailed chapter on the boundary issue. So these issues have to be resolved because if they are not resolved, they will only become, uh, you know, sores, cancerous sores that will uh, really complicate the relationship. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Um, so now I now invite two other panelists at the session, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal and Atul Thakurji, uh, to share your observation uh, on the book. Over to you, Pramodji, first. Uh, thank you, Kosti. Thank you so much. Uh, I read this book twice, and it is one of the rare books on Nepal and the relations. And I read it twice, and I enjoyed it because at most uh, places I echo with what Ambassador Rai is mentioning. That's why that is the real pleasure that when you, your thoughts resemble with the author, you enjoy the book. That is the major reason that I read it twice. I have been saying that uh, what I've observed uh, like in my last 15 years of my engagement with Indian scholars is that I have found Indian scholars very diplomatic, like, like a diplomat. But here is a book where a diplomat has played a role of a scholar a free frank discussion, many issues that many Indian scholars would have avoid mentioning or discussing. So that is the real pleasure, or you can say the worth of the book. Uh, that's why when I read the first line of the book that the book is not a scholarly, I, I, I disagree on the right first sentence of the author that the book is not, disc uh, not so scholarly, it's very useful for scholars. Uh, in 250 words, I mean, the author has put history, politics, ge geopolitics, China factor, uh, you know, internal dynamics. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, tremendous job that the author has done. It would have been very difficult for us to put all those thoughts in a very concise manner. Uh, similarly, the book starts with a very interesting topic, like why of men, I think it's one of the most important question that why uh, people in Nepal hate India or do, they do not like us, uh, we can say. And I think that is the starting point of uh, Nepal in the relations. I think any scholar, if they want to do research on that, I think that should be the starting point. They should start questioning that why, in spite of spending so much of resources, such a deep engagement, such a special relations, where almost every houses in Nepal have some Indian connections, whether they have studied, they have relatives, they have traveled, or they have very close friends why people in, still, people in Nepal is still, still do not like India. Uh, this is a very important question, I think, which every scholar has to start if they really want to follow uh, Nepal-India relations. I'm not going to talk on the content of the book, there will be no content, but let me raise a few questions, uh, what I have also observed and which could have been a little bit better. I think uh, we all know that India is always a determining force in Nepal's political uh, transformation in every Nepal's uh, major political change, India is a factor. And because of that, there is love and hate for India. We like India because India is one of the major players that have supported our democracy. At the same time, there is emergence of anti-India feeling for that particular factor, that India is one of the major player, India is one of the determining force, and those forces who lose the game, who are out of those uh, proper uh, geo, uh, that political game, they are the one who hates. It can be any forces, it can be the royalists of the past, or it can be the Maoist of the past, or it can be any uh, only of the present. So I think in any political changes, uh, India is a player, and that is the region that generates hate as well as love for the country. A second is that what is missing is that India, all about the di Indian diaspora, many Nepalese go to Gulf, they work in different, uh, as a migrant workers, they work in different organizations, companies, where they, are, they have Indian supervisors. So it's the same, that also generates lots of anti-India feeling in those people because they have a uh, supervisor who is from India, and you know, when you have a supervisor, you don't have good relations. So it's like the kind of uh, treatment, obviously, as many Nepalese also have that 
experience in India where they're not treated well. But same thing goes to Gulf. If you can go to Gulf, many of the Nepalese, they have not been to India. They go to Gulf and they come with that anti-India feeling or you can say unpleasant feeling because of that, uh, uh, the behavior of their supervisors. That part maybe could happen touched a little. Uh, similar is that uh, I think author also talks about poor state of Madhes. And as we all know that India is one of the major factor for Nepal's development. It's one of the major development providers. I think India should also take some blame of that, that you know, the failure of Madhes, the poor state of Madhes, uh, you know, the, uh, the blame goes to uh, India as well. Obviously on the Nepal government, but that has to go on India as well. So that, I think that part uh, should have been touched a little. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, to some extent, I disagree with uh, the author that he said that uh, I think Nepal would not have supported BRI, Nepal would not have, not have signed BRI if there was no blockade or so-called blockade of 2015. But the author says, no, it would have been, uh, get endorsed, but I think it was impossible at that time because the way in Nepal and India had strong ties at that time, it was almost difficult for Nepal to get a BRI sign, and we have seen the result here. We have not got any uh, remarkable outcome of BRI. That clearly shows that even after signing the project, if there can be no remarkable achievement, the project would not have initially signed. And that is what I believe in. Uh, one thing that I am saying is that I disagree with the train link. Like many of the authors in Nepal or in India, they say that uh, if like the link uh, train, like if train that comes from China, uh, what will it take it back? I think uh, this is a different question. I think we should ask what did China gained in 2016, 62. In 1962, China built Arnico Highway, 100 kilometer, kilometer road. At that time where China had cultural, uh, what you call cultural revolution, where country was in devastated situation. They had recently fought the Indians. They had, uh, they had fought the uh, Japanese. The country was in complete chaos. There was famine. In that situation, that poor China, which had no trade with Nepal, if they could build 100 kilometer road from a difficult train from uh, Tatopani to Kathmandu, I think today China is very rich. They can build the trade. So I think a train that comes from China will also take something from India from Nepal, it can be tourists, it can be goods, or the modern China has the capacity to generate those products that can be taken from Nepal to China. So I think if we say that, no, you know, it's, it is, I mean, Chinese will be expecting something in return, obviously they expect, but they also have the capacity to generate that. It is too early to leave that, you know, a train will go empty and there, or you can say, um, without any goods from Nepal side, because with train, there'll be many uh, industrial parks coming up. Uh, in next one more minute, what I want to say is that... Uh, Obviously, I want you to cut it short because uh, we need to just move it forward. Like, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, so the, I think uh, there is one, <coughs> last point I have to mention is that obviously there is discussion on water sharing project. I just want to mention that the water sharing project with any country, I think Nepalese have done politics on our own development projects and we have failed miserably. In the past, we did it with India, uh, we, when it comes to power, or you can say water sharing, at the moment we are doing on MCC and BRI. I think this development project should be uh, not linked with nationalism or pol politics of the country. Uh, that is one of the major reasons that Nepal has remained poor. We have done politics on all our development projects with India in the past, when it comes to hydropower, with BRI, China at present, or MCC at the moment. I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, Atulji, over to you. Your Thank you, Kosraji. It's a pleasure being here on, uh, for a very important discussion. Uh, I gone through the book. I am one of the early readers of this beautiful book, which is uh, certainly a publisher's delight. I have been a writer, columnist, as well as a literary critic and ad advisor for many, many of the writers, even from Nepal. You know, the scene has been blossoming, literary scene has been blossoming in Nepal. And you will be surprised to know how Indian publishers treat anything which is written on Nepal. But for long, for a long period of time, there has been no official account or even say, no Indian ambassador, former ambassador has written anything in long format on Nepal. So my compliment to Ambassador Ranjit, Ranjit Ray, uh, sir, this is a beautiful book. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it and I'm going to review it as well. Uh, it's a candid book, certainly. It's, uh, it gives you an honest account of what, what happened in Nepal in the last two and a half decades, especially since the Maoist insurgency started in, in mid 90s and how the times traveled afterwards. 
I I will say this book is certainly not an academic as written in uh, as it starts, but it's certainly a scholarly book. It it is also meant for for the mass readers, but it is wrong to say that it's not a scholarly book. It's a well researched book, beautifully written. And when it comes to the facts, I don't think even a single fact is wrong wrong in in, the, in this book. Coming back to the point of uh, of Dr. Pramod, he has raised some, some uh, very important issues regarding BRI and others. BRI is not a simple scheme of thing, as we all know. It's it's not only related to development. And if you are saying that the trend is going to come from China, then it should not be a hypothetical statement. You know, something has to be on the ground. But look at the condition. India has made the uh, uh, railway line between Janagar to Janakpur, and even after that. But four years later, even now, this has not been operational. So you have this is a small example to capture how how the development works are taking place in Nepal, where politics is dominating the development discourse. This has to be asked by Nepalese to their own politicians, and just been pointing about India's role is not going to be enough. See one one more thing I would like to hear state here that India never calls it a foreign aid when it comes to development works in Nepal. We call it development partnership. This reflects on our complementarity, a friendly gesture towards Nepal. Indian establishment has been very transparent in dealing with the Nepal. Though, although the time, time and again, you know, Nepal ha has really faced unusual, unusual conditions at political level, even at socio-economic level. Even now, things are not so easy. But this book, I think, which, which certainly fills the gap, gap, and I don't think. Anything which, 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 is, which is not written here, Every, anyone who has interest in Nepal must go through it and then get benefited with the views of Ambassador Ray. There can be a disagreement, no doubt about it, because any book has to be opinionated. There can be certain differences. But when it comes to facts, I will certainly endorse this book that factually this book is correct, absolutely correct. So I will be happy to take questions at, at, at later stages, Kosaraji, because the time is running yeah. short. Thank you, thank you. Thank Interesting you. observation. Yeah. Um, so now I, I just have a couple of questions uh, before we can take a question from our audience, if there are any. So Ambassador Rai, he already mentioned there is there is there are questions like people say, you know, Ambassador has put the title. It is Kathmandu's dilemma. Why not New Delhi's dilemma? That I completely agree. Yeah, and it you is know, Delhi's, Delhi's dilemma first. Yeah, and you know, there, there seems to be dilemma on the both the, both the sides. For example, if you look at our bilateral relation, there are many things that are not moving. For example, EPG report, that's a good example. Uh, EPG report itself is gathering dust somewhere. We don't know where it is. Yeah. And, you know, we have so many issues that have come up in the last few years. Uh, and Joint Commission meeting is supposed to take up all these issues. And Joint Commission meeting is not taking place anytime soon. And also the outstanding border disputes they are not even in the you know, agenda of formal interaction between the two countries. Now, uh, in, in this context, who do, you, who do you think is in a greater dilemma? <coughs> Kathmandu or it is New Delhi? Is this for Ambas me? Ambassador oh, Raya. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for the questions. You know, I am no longer in government, so I really uh, I'm not in a position to, to say, you know, whether the EPG report is gathering dust or what is happening to it. But all I would say from a very pragmatic point of view is that, you know, the report was completed, I think, uh, more than two years ago. And it has not seen the light of day. So obviously there is some problem. Uh, and so I really personally feel that we should focus on what is the key element of the report. I mean, I haven't seen the report, but what I've been told is that a review of the 1950 treaty is, uh, you know, Nepal's key agenda in that report. So I personally feel that this matter <laughs> should be taken up at the level of the two governments, you know, at the level of the two foreign secretaries. They should start discussing the 1950 treaty. And, you know, our position on the, the India's position on the treaty was already made very clear by Prime Minister Modi uh, when he visited in August 2014, you know, that we are prepared, you know, to consider whatever uh, Nepal has in mind. So I personally feel we should start the uh, discussions. On the boundary, uh, I'm afraid I have a, you know, quite a strong position because see the way we look at the boundary, 
you know, whatever be the, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, whether it was an emotional decision of the Nepalese, but the fact that you have now changed your map uh, without really giving any evidence uh, in justification of that. Uh, uh, and now you, now Nepal says to India, we would like to discuss with you this whole thing. So that's a very peculiar kind of uh, position. I mean, suppose India had taken parts of Nepalese territory and put it in our map. And then India comes to you and says, okay, we are prepared to discuss it with you. Would you accept it? You know, this is what is happening by, by uh, you know, a country in, uh, for instance, the South China Sea area, etc. You know, you take over some islands and so on. And then you tell the neighboring countries, okay, now we are prepared to discuss with you. So that is not the right position. And I have a very detailed chapter on the boundary. And, you know, I hope friends from Nepal will respond to it because I've given a lot of evidence as to why uh, what Nepal has done uh, through this new constitutional amendment is really not based on any historical evidence uh, or, or uh, uh, facts. On the Joint Commission, I think the Joint Commission meets regularly. And as far as I know, there was a meeting... Uh, between uh, our external affairs minister, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar, and the Nep and his Nepalese uh, counterpart. So, if if it hasn't been held, certainly the Joint Commission must be held. And you know, my view has been that, irrespective of the differences between the two countries, our relationship is so important for both that we must continue to engage, and that you know, issues uh, or differences uh, should not prevent engagement. And they should certainly not prevent our economic partnership. So all those processes must continue and be intensified, even if there are problems in the relationship. Obviously, those problems have to be addressed and resolved as well. But, uh, you know, in any relationship which is so close and intimate, there will be problems. Yeah. So you have to discuss uh, and resolve those problems. Yeah. So, Pramoji, do you have anything to say on this? Uh, Whose so, dilemma it is? Who has greater dilemma to reset uh, the time? There's a question that I've shared you on chat, which I've got on Facebook, and then maybe we can come. Sure. Yeah. sure. Okay. So, shall I first ask the question from Facebook? Yes, there are lots of questions coming up, so that maybe people will be more engaging. Okay. Okay. That's nice. So, let me take first question, and uh, it's the question for Ambassador Rai. So, the first question. Um, you know, you served under both the governments. How do you look at India-Nepal relation under Prime Minister Modi and previous NDA government headed by Dr. Manmohan Singh? So my experience is that on foreign policy, there are no major changes, uh, substantive changes. There may be changes of style. You know, Prime Minister Modi was a very people's man. He started with the neighborhood first policy, invited all SARC heads for his wearing in you know, made two visits in quick su succession and a very people's man, you know, he would stop his motorcade in Kathmandu and just get out of the motorcade and greet people. Uh, so th the style of his predecessor was very different. You know, this, uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was more of an academic bent uh, and, you know, a little more reserved. But in terms of policy, in terms of the substance of the policy, I don't think there's any change. And, you know, I also had the opportunity of serving with Prime Minister Vajpayee. So when I started working in the Ministry of External Affairs, it was under Prime Minister Vajpayee. So in 2004, the government went to the UPA. And even at that time, I did not see any uh, substantive change uh, in foreign policy. And Nepal has been, you know, a very high priority for all, all governments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think we also have another question. Maybe uh, Atulji, Pramoji, it's yeah. about media. So... So there's a question. Media plays very important role in maintaining relationship between two states, as seen presently in Indian media. Indian media has been very insensitive with headlines, whether it was about Lipu Lake or about Manisha Kerala being, I mean, coming in support for our country. And there were some cases, you know, using inappropriate headlines regarding Nepal's prime minister. So is it not a part of policy to be sensitive regarding these issues? Maybe Atulji can, uh, you know, respond to this question. Yeah, Kosaraji, I agree with with, uh, with the question to an extent because you know this does not reflect on the uh, India's official line. Anywhere, it is al almost impossible to control me media's way of functioning, and they have. And as Ambassador Ray has rightly said, that there is lack of education about Nepal. Many people in that he is really not aware of, about Nepal and how it how it works. What 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 are the fundamentals? How diverse is the country? They think it like a small country 
which is 70 minutes away from Delhi, which is not diverse. There are only two set of people living there. A lot of there, there has been lack of uh, education about, about, about the country. Many people have not visited Nepal before writing in detail about the country, about the politics, etc. So to an extent, we, we it is we nobody can defend the media's role, and I'm sure you you also know that there has been exceptions. You you know it very well. That, yes. But a certain section of media has really played a very bad role uh, for India-Nepal relations. It's no doubt about it. Even in Nepal as well, including in Nepal as well. So this is not something which we, we should defend. Nobody should defend it because media is media can't be the part of India's official life. So we have to take it like that, and we have to see it in isolation. It has to be restrained, and restraint has to come from within. Nobody is going to put put pressure on someone because both the countries are democracy. So this is my point of view. Okay, thank you. That was interesting. Um, so I think there is another question for Ambassador Rai. Um, you know, although there are differences uh, in terms of this, you know, the, the border disruption in, in Nepal, we call it blockade imposed by India, uh, but Indian stance official position is different. But here there's a question, in your opinion, in your opinion, what did Delhi learn from 2015 economic blockade? And has Kathmandu revisited its relation from the episode since then? Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, as you've already said, uh, you know, we don't agree with the term blockade. But I think uh, one very important lesson that we learned, and this is where the dilemma comes in, you know, our approach during the whole constitutional uh, drafting process was that, you know, for Nepal to have long term stability and progress and prosperity, an inclusive constitution that uh, uh, you know, that uh, recognizes uh, and implements the agreements, you know, of the peace process with the Maoists and the Madesi agitation, that would be the best way for Nepal to be stable uh, and secure and prosperous. Otherwise, there would always be, uh, you know, difficulties uh, uh, within the country. Uh, and, you know, obviously that view was not acceptable by the leadership of the time. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in reaction to India's view, this whole outreach to China was made. Uh, and, you know, after that, there was a, a course correction in terms of uh, Indian policy. So I think one of the lessons that we've learned is, is this. I don't know whether we are able to handle this dilemma very well, whether, you know, we should have uh, changed our policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis an inclusive constitution, uh, or adopted some other approach, it's very difficult, uh, you know, uh, to say. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is the dilemma when you have several objectives and, you know, you follow a strategy to achieve something, uh, then that complicates, uh, you know, something else, uh, then what do you do? So I think all, uh, all decision makers, all foreign policy practitioners face this dilemma and they have to decide as best as they can, depending on the circumstances. Okay, thank you. So, you know, we'll be talking about issues at the macro level. There are, there are issues which are the concern of ordinary people. For instance, India had, you know, demonetization and a large number of Nepalese people were affected by that because, you know, there are so many people who are working as a security guard to housemate to uh, any, many other works in India. But then their currency was not exchanged. Don't you think these kind of issues bring you know, some problems in our relation. So this is the question asked to Ambassador Rai. Yeah, so let me explain our thinking on this at the time. And, you know, I was the ambassador in 2015 when the demonetization happened. And, you know, the fear in India at that time was that if we exchange the money uh, with Nepal, then a lot of the black money or unaccounted money from India would go across uh, into Nepal and then it would get uh, legitimized. Uh, it would be changed. And I think that is the reason why there was hesitation. But I think now it is five, six years uh, after that event. Uh, and we should have no difficulty in uh, changing, uh, you know, whatever money is available uh, with the Nepal uh, Rashtra Bank. I mean, it's a small sum of money. And uh, I really feel uh, that this should be changed uh, as soon as possible. I don't see any problem in, uh, in doing this. At that time, there was a problem. Today, I don't think there's any problem and this should be done. Yeah, um, thank you. So, Pramodji, uh, you have something to say about EPZ. Uh, like, let me briefly comment on EPZ and the media question. Like, uh, 
Actually, what I believe is that in Nepal, uh, of course, you are aware that all the <coughs> would blame India, that the report is submitted to uh, the Indian Prime Minister and then uh, probably he's not very happy. I mean, uh, there are, it is possible that he's not very happy, but what could have been done is that if uh, there are also reports that maybe it would have complicated the relations. I think what India should have done is that if the report was not, if the report was very useful, it could have been implemented. If not, it could have been thrown to the people for discussion. It could have been shared with think tanks or people from both the sides to discuss. If it is not worthy, I'm sure the people would not have will not endorse it. So I think if the people from both the side are okay with the report, there is no harm in sharing it, discussing it, or implementing it. If it is not, we can if I, if that is situation, we can also improve it. But just holding the report, not making it public, has raised lots of suspicion, lots of uh, what you call blame game and all those uh, here in Nepal. Uh, second is media question. I mean, we all know that how aware are our media, both Indian media or Nepali media, when it comes to reporting on foreign policy. You know, you, uh, if you are aware of one joke that when Xi Jinping visited India on Durdarshan, he was called 11 Jinping, you know. So if Xi Jinping is not known by the journalist, forget about, you know, uh, Oli or, or other primaries. So I think the media of both the countries are not aware when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, that is what is re required. I mean, uh, there has been frequent visit by, uh, uh, organized by Indian embassy where the major journalists from Nepal are invited to India and taken around for tour. I have met a couple of them when I was in IDC, so we welcome them. I think those are important. But beyond that, you know, how much can you train or you can make them retreat in 10 or 10, 10 or 15 days? What is most important is the, the role of Nepal Study Center or India Study Center. In India, there is one India Study Center where which really lacks resources. To be very frank, uh, we know the state is in a very sorry state of situation. And in Nepal, we don't have a single India Study Center. You know, the number of Nepal Study Center in China is more than in India. So this is where both the countries should work. I mean, we can't say that we don't know each other, media is ignorant, and we have to live with that. I mean, what is the solution? So I think, is it so difficult for India to establish two or three India Study Center in Nepal or Nepal to start India Study Center in India? Uh, if you look at the number of experts looking at India, it's like horrible. Like uh, we claim that both the countries have very good relations and it all, we also claim and we accept that India has the highest number of Nepal experts in the world. I mean, obviously America might not have any, but if India is so special and since we are neighbor, these expertise will work. I mean, uh, before Doklam, I hardly knew any Bhutan expert. And then after that, you find so many people coming and commenting about it and creating more ignorance than knowledge among the people. So this happens when situation comes, then lots of people erupt ill-informed and they add to the problem rather than resolve the problem. So for that, you have to prepare now when the situation is normal and then you can listen. So I think there's a need for the government from both sides to start Nepal Study Center. We need each other's awareness, understanding. So I think that is very important. And I think uh, this should be strongly raised on both the sides. Uh, then uh, one thing is that there's also lack of uh, awareness about diversity of Nepal. You know, I have my own experience in India. So these things are really important. We are close neighbor and they, we need to be, have, we should have more understanding about each other. Uh, second is that when it comes to foreign policy, yes, we both have uh, democratic countries, but I think there should be some guidelines at least uh, where we can, where we can, which, which can be provided to journalists from both the countries that, you know, certain guidelines will really improve the relation between the two countries. Uh, to the journalist on what should be reported, how should be, and how should they approach. I mean, if they, there are chances that journalists might not have those information, so they should have certain places where they can contact, you know, and those can be eliminated. So I think uh, this media and uh, awareness about Nepal, Nepal Study Center, or India Center are very important to improve the relation between two countries. Thank you. Thank you, Pramaji, for your insight. I think I want to take our ambassador to uh, back to his book. Um, you know, there's an interesting anecdote in a book, especially in the light of the criticism that India often faces that, you know, India is often micromanaging things in Nepal. That in that particular anecdote, you have mentioned that former Home Minister asking you about India's preference for the appointment of police chief, new police chief, and you have mentioned that uh, 
uh, you have advised them uh, to appoint those who are in merit and those who are fully qualified, and India has nothing to do with that. Sitting minister of a country asking Indian ambassador for suggestion to make decision that is purely their jurisdiction. You know, why do you think that this happens in Nepal, Ambassador Rai? Well, you know, I think it depends on the kind of trust uh, and credibility that you establish with your interlocutors. Uh, so, uh, you know, this could happen anywhere. I don't think it's, you know, it happens uh, only in Nepal. Uh, it could happen uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, and, 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 you know, I know this created a lot of controversy uh, in Nepal, largely because of a misunderstanding. You know, I have referred to two separate incidents. And I think, uh, you know, there was confusion and it was all converted into one incident. Uh, so this was only by way of illustration, you know, to, to show that uh, it's not that India is constantly micromanaging uh, on its own. Uh, and also I've said that, you know, this has problems because, you know, obviously, uh, you, you know, if, 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 if you support one thing, then the other person or the other uh, groups feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, un unhappy. Uh, so it's, a, it's really like, a, it's a very difficult uh, uh, situation. But, um, uh, you know, it also reflects, I think, the importance that both countries attach to our security and intelligence cooperation, uh, you know, especially since we have uh, open borders. Uh, so I think it's a combination of all these factors. And I wouldn't really say that, uh, you know, this happens in Nepal uh, or, uh, you know, another country that this is a general phenomenon uh, that happens. Ramaji, what do you think about this? Is this the perceived thing or is, is, is this real about this India micromanaging things in Nepal? Well, uh, this is one of the most interesting story that uh, is covered by most Nepali media here in Nepal about micromanagement. I mean, uh, <coughs> from the print of print paper of Kantipur and all those. So, I mean, it's very old story, but let me use this opportunity to raise a few points, which really touch the sensitivity. And I want to use this in a frank manner. Like there are some mannerism, like uh, th there is the book Ambassador has said that he asked C.P. Gazurel after about talking his, uh, you know, time, uh, spend his time in jail in, he said, so you might have learned to like idli or dosa. I think this kind of black humor, I mean, uh, maybe it was in humor, but I think from Ambassador, uh, for someone who has had a hard time in jail, I think it's black humor. Uh, this should have been avoided uh, for the beauty of the book. So that is one. I, I just want to be frank. I mean, if I were to speak as well, I would have felt hurt or insulted. So these things are maybe are very sensitive. That is what I said. You know, there is a photo when uh, uh, Ambassador Sood met with a diplomat and he had wore sandals. It's normal. I've seen in India that all our bosses or in IDC or the diplomats, they wear it because of the weather. But it was taken like a big noise was there in Kathmandu. So these are People in Nepal are very sensitive. They see from you know head to tail, and they find excuses. So India has to be extra cautious. If some, if a British or say American or Western diplomat wear shorts, it will be modernized, or you can say westernized. But they do not consider Indianized kind of things here in Nepal because of sensitivity. So that is what I want to say. Second is that uh, 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 there is one more issue that I want to say, like here. There's also one word that he says that the godless prime minister, prime minister of the leftist variety have no faith. And this variety, I mean, it's like this word, I mean, the copy editor, I really didn't like that part of it, that the godless prime minister, obviously uh, the communist prime minister do not believe in God. So godless prime minister of the leftist variety. This particular variety word, if you, I mean, if you start reading, these words could have been avoided. So these are things, I mean, uh, that comes, why I'm pointing is that this comes in the behavior of Indian diplomats, Indian uh, friends, Indian media, Indian business houses, Indian anyone. Like when I interact with my friend, we sometimes get touched, you know. Uh, sometimes swallow, you are from India. I mean, I feel so offended uh, to be very frank. I'm not from India, just because I'm Jack swallow. Because I realize when the same thing in Nepal, like, so you are from, you are from India. So, there's two contradictions. Here in Nepal, I'm Madesi and my friends say, oh, you're Jaswal, are you Nepali? And then the other side, they say, uh, you are from India. So when I feel offended on this side, I equally feel 
threatened on the other side. That, oh, no, I'm, I'm not Indian, and you are branding me as Indian, and that's why I have a problem on the other side. It's same on that. Like when India supported, I don't know, but because of blockade, now it was very difficult for Nepalese to raise those genuine concerns. Obviously, the context and everything was different. But many times when Nepalese raised their gen Madhesi raised their genuine concern because of oh India, the whole debate gets ended with the India question or Indian loyalty and all those. So I think these things are very sensitive and these two things should be discussed. And I don't know where to put the mark and how to deal with it, but these are very uh, sensitive things here in Nepal. Thank you. Thank you, Pramuji. I think, you know, the book has really interesting thing. There are many things uh, and some of some aspect of that book we have already discussed. Uh, the ambassador also, you know, uh, in detail explained about how India could reach uh, I mean, the agreement that they have reached before in 1949. Uh, and that has not happened in case of Nepal, like we have a peace and friendship treaty and there are section of political parties who are demanding revision of that treaty. Um, you know, many people in Nepal, they deem this treaty as unequal and that has not happened. And also uh, we could see, uh, you know, the ambassador also highlighted how, uh, you know, uh, the unity between uh, then UML and CPN Maoist Center, Maoist um, party that, you know, often uh, that, that, that was described as a set back to India, the ambassador has highlighted. Um, Ambassador, do you think that like you know, these two parties are split again? And do you think that this will have a strategic advantage to India? And does this help to further strengthen, uh, you know, ties between Nepal and India? How there are two, no, there are two ways. First, I want to say India, you know, the relationship with Nepal is so important that we have to have good relations with whichever government is in power, whether it is UML or Congress or Maoist, uh, you know, or any government because the relationship is very important. Two, the unification of the communist force in Nepal cannot be looked at in isolation. You have to look at this in the context of uh, uh, the growing role of China uh, in Nepal. And I think that is what uh, 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 is, uh, you know, is, is an issue that we have to, I think, the Nepalese have to monitor and so does India. Because, uh, you know, we have seen in the last few years that uh, uh, there is a very strong uh, involvement of uh, the, your Nepal's northern neighbor in domestic political processes uh, in Nepal. And I think that is a very new development. You know, the kind of relationship that has been established between the erstwhile Nepal Communist Party and the Chinese Communist Party, the kind of exchanges and visits. Uh, so I think this is a new development and this is something that it's ready for the people of Nepal uh, to see. So, you know, so you have to look at the unification of the communist parties in the context uh, of the role of uh, Nepal's uh, northern neighbor. And, you know, I think that's the way India has been uh, uh, looking at it. Now, you know, political fragmentation and consolidation keeps happening in Nepal. And this really depends on the circumstances. It depends on whether elections are being, uh, you know, held or not being held. So this is something, this is the nuts and bolts of uh, politics uh, in any a democracy and this is nothing unusual uh, however this uh, you know what we find a little unusual is that there is an external factor behind this uh, mobilization of all communist uh, parties uh, and you know this this is something that uh, i think uh, uh, you know has to be uh, looked at uh, by both countries ambassador many people in nepal say that china learned from india do you agree with this you see, India's, uh, con in India's context, I think, is different. You know, look at the relationship between the two countries. The founding fathers of Nepalese democracy were in India. They cut their uh, democratic teeth in India. They participated in the Indian freedom movement. They went to jail in India. Uh, you know, they, they took inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi's freedom movement. And, you know, they wanted to bring about a similar change. Uh, in Nepal. So the context is completely different. I mean, there can be a, no comparison, I think, uh, between India's historical role uh, uh, and role of any other country. And, you know, while I have the floor, I do want to uh, uh, make one point. You know, uh, recently I've seen a series of articles that argue that, uh, you know, India made the mistake of getting involved in Nepalese domestic politics, as a result of which India has lost a lot of friends and gained no uh, credit in Nepal. 
so you know at the time of the rana pact we offended the ranas then you know during the panchayat period we offended the, the monarchy uh, during the maoist insurgency period we again offended the ruling establishment and so on and then they contrast this with china's role that china basically supported the monarchy and that was very good for chinese uh, uh, you know, foreign policy and security interests in Nepal. And then they say that maybe India should also have not got involved. But, you know, I think this reflects a lack of understanding of the nature of relationship between the two countries. And the question I ask you is this, that if these political changes and transformations not taken place in Nepal, if the Maoist insurgency had not ended in Nepal in 2005, uh, November, what would uh, Nepal's... Uh, uh, you know, course of history looked like. So this is something people forget. And, you know, even on Twitter, I get a lot of comments saying, you know, India is responsible for, you know, China's growing role, etc., etc., etc. But, you know, the point I'm making is that if these agreements had not been realized, you know, can you imagine uh, what the situation in Nepal would have been like? If suppose the Madesi agitation had not been resolved with the agreement in 2008. So, you know, it's very easy to say with hindsight that, you know, you did wrong, you should have not got involved, etc. But, uh, you know, I don't buy that. Uh, I don't buy that. Argument. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I think we discussed a lot, uh, you know, different aspects of our relations. Uh, I think it's good to talk about ways forward. And I think we have like uh, less than five minutes now. Uh, I want each of you to uh, highlight what should be done to, you know, further strengthen our bilateral relation, or in, in other words, to reset our ties in the days to come? So, Ambassador, over to you, and then to Atulji, and then to Pramuji. Well, I'll be very brief since I've spoken too much, but I think we have very solid foundations to our relationship, but we now need to develop very deep and robust economic foundations through our bilateral connectivity initiatives, through our sub-regional connectivity initiatives, and through joint projects, and particularly in the hydropower sector. If Nepal can produce a hydropower and you know, sell to India and Bangladesh and other countries in the region, this will bring the economies of the countries together, and it will create uh, you know, a huge multiplier effect and growth momentum in our entire region. So I really think the focus for the future should be economic engagement, number one. And two, I think engagement between our youth. <coughs> I think, you know, our youth is growing distant. You know, our political parties and young parliamentarians are growing distant. And so, you know, the youth really have to lead this relationship into, into the future. So we must really focus on programs that bring the youth of our two countries together. Thank you. Now over to you, Atulji. Thank you, Postasi. Uh, we have a strong foundation, as rightly said by Ambassador Ranitra. And second thing, we have to also look on the priorities. What priorities we have is still looking back again and again. It's all right that in the context of book, we are talking about those uh, you know moments, tough moments of 1990s, then when 2015 and later on. But about the priorities in the post-pandemic uh, time, the most pressing factor as of now is how to get the economic rebounding at the place, how to ensure the public health, health safety in both the countries. And as far as the, as the permanent impression is concerned, I think Nepal is the land of opportunity, hope, and India's best, uh, most trustworthy neighbor, no doubt about it. And India can't see Nepal as a land of dispute. So I have seen a question in the chat box where it's, it, someone, is, someone is saying that why India is not trying to speak with China and Nepal at the same time. India should not do it and they will not do it for, the, for a very simple reason that India thinks that with Nepalish term is really unique and very, very close and deeply, you know, based on complementarity. So I think we must be bullish about our bilateral relations. There is no need of any fear or anything. Our relationship is very, very strong, and we are moving in very right direction. And testi testimony of the fact is that in late evening, we are talking with one of most, you know, illustrious Indian diplomats. It's not an easy thing. You can't, you can't have such privilege of speaking with, you know, any Chinese ambassador, former Chinese ambassador, or someone from there. So this is the this is this is the mark of our our relations, and I'm I'm quite positive about it. 
Yeah, thank you, Prabhuji. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Prabhuji. Uh, first of all, I agree with Ambassador Ray when he said that India has played an important role in Nepal, uh, Nepal's democratic uh, transition or Nepal's democratization. Uh, what Nepal have today, uh, there's a strong foundation of India. Uh, we would not have achieved uh, what we have achieved today without India's support, which is, uh, which is uh, a fact. Uh, what can Nepal do? I think first is understanding. We really don't understand Nepal or each other. There should be discussion like this. There should be, as I said, study centers. Uh, we still, many of us still see India of the past and we are not able to understand where India is today. But at the same time, uh, there are many of us uh, who have seen what India is at the present. Uh, we are impressed by India's economic development. And with the rise of India, with the rise of India's development, the aspirations of Nepalese have also increased. Now, since India has uh, rise up, we also want to rise and we want similar, uh, what you call support from India. Uh, why do youths of Nepal today want to go to Europe or China and not to India? Uh, this is a question, and though India has a uh, rise up because one is that many of have not seen the rising India that we want to go to Europe. At the same time, many of those who don't can't go to Europe, they want to look at India rising and they want to, you know, expect from India. So there's both sides. Those who see India rising are expecting too much, and those who don't see India rising are moving to Europe. Because in the past, India was Europe and America for every Nepalese. So that is what is a gap. The youth, the young youth, the rich and middle class are moving to Europe. Well, the one who have access to India have more expression here, they don't want to go to Europe. Uh, what can India do is that I think India should make sure that Nepal is not, not left behind. Um, uh, we need more development projects for India. We need more connectivity. Uh, the connectivity between India and Nepal has diminished. I have remembered uh, traveling to uh, India, Zainazar on railway. I have my phone memories when I was a kid, I used to go to India. The train links has been come back, but maybe my children will be able to use it. I'm not sure uh, in five, two or three years, because it's long delayed. I mean, it's three, four years, we have a leak, we have railway and there's no funds. So that is the pace what I'm just making fun of. Like the pace of development has to increase. We have a railway, we have a link, but there's no protocol or whatever. Who is responsible? I don't care. It's both sides. So this is what the both governments should sit together and increase the pace of development. And we should make sure that Nepal is not left behind. If Nepal is left behind, people will go to China. Why do Nepalese like China is another question. I think ambassador, uh, some ambassador from Nepal to China should write. Why do Nepalese like to China, go to China where we don't have any uh, deep engagement, no people to people ties. Why do we like to, we don't understand the language, neither we like uh, Chinese food, nor we eat many of their foods. Why do we like it? So I think that is also another part which we have to look at. Those, if you understand what people like China, then I think India will be able to resolve the problem that is between the two countries. We like India, uh, we like Chinese money, and India also like that. It's not only Nepal like that. It's same with <coughs> Japanese, Korean, and all uh, uh, what you call Australians. They all like to engage with China economically because they want to benefit from that. Nepal also wants to do that. The moment Nep India replaces or what you call fulfills those needs, we don't have to go to China. So I think I would like to end there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was insightful. Thank you, Ambassador, for highlighting this and you know underscoring the need to develop economic foundation, economic partnership, and also Atulji for highlighting, you know, uh, giving us you know insightful um, ideas to strengthen our bilateral relation. So many people say we are too close yet too far. I think we need to think about this, like how we can you know, uh, enhance our partnership, especially in development partnership, and how we can have, you know, joint project. For example, there's a good thing that Arun Thor project is moving on, uh, and that will bring a lot of de development dividend to Nepal as well, and also to the entire region. So I think this is a way forward, and I think it's very important for us to understand each other's sensitivities be it security sensitivities, be it any other kinds of sensitivities. And we, if we just appreciate each other's differences, appreciate each other's concern, sensitivities, and if we develop our economic partnership in a more robust way, I think that is the way forward. Um, thank you all for joining our program. Thank you, Ambassador Ryan. We look forward to have you in similar opportunity in future. Um, thank you, Dr. Pramod, and thank you, Atulji. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Namaskar.